and in a one world system and a one world money order and, and there will be this antichrist that comes on the scene and he'll set up his kingdom and there will be the mark of the beast. And the comment that was made to me and, I, and I've reflected on it since and it's really stirred me is he said you and I may, because we're in the same age bracket, he said we will very quickly recognize that system. But he said our kids are being brainwashed to accept it. And uh, you stop and think about what he said, and it's so true, because if you went back 50 years, uh, you know, you, you look at media today, multimedia, Facebook, and all that. You go back 50 years ago, there wasn't even computers. And uh, then you have the, and, and you know, when they first come out with the radio, they preached hard against that radio. That's just the signs of the time. They was probably not too far off, to be honest. And you say, why would you say that? Because... It's the biggest propagation of information between radio and television and media. You know, we got worldwide propagation of news. And so, anyways, he, you know, I, I can see where our children can be bombarded every day with, with whatever somebody wants to tell them. And after a while, after you're bombarded with something long enough, it will become part of your reality. And... Uh, I preached a few weeks ago about uh, cult and about some of the different aspects of cults and, and what they do to brainwash people. You see that very prevalent in society. You just keep, keep jabbing away, and after a while, you get them to believe the agenda. It doesn't matter what it is. And you say, oh, that'll never happen to me. Do you know how many people thought that would never happen to them that wound up in some cult or some group or believing something they thought they would never believe? We really need to pray. And so we're going to go to prayer this morning. And would you open your hearts and ask the Lord to open your hearts this morning to the Word of God. Father, we're so thankful today. Lord, the privilege that we have together in your house once again. We pray, Lord, that you touch this morning. Lord, as your Word is looked into today, God, that you'd minister to each one of us that's gathered in this place. Lord, that your anointing would rest upon us. God, that you'd touch each one of us afresh. Lord, open our hearts and open our eyes, we pray. Lord, to the tactics of our enemy. God, that we would see what he's doing and where he's going and what he's up to. And God, that our eyes would be wide open, our spiritual ears would be open. God, we'd see what he's up to. And God, that we would take the temptations he throws our way. And Lord, we would take them aside, Lord, and we wouldn't follow through with them. God, I pray this morning for this service. Minister to us. Lord, anoint my lips of clay. Anoint my mind, I pray. And Lord, let us receive what your word has got for each one of us and what you would have to speak to the church. Lord, we'll thank you this morning. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Would you give me a hearty amen this morning before you're seated? Amen. You may be seated. The last few weeks we've been teaching about victory and victory belonging to us and then victory over this old guy, you know, ourselves, victory over self. And this morning we just want to take that a little farther in, in the next few weeks and talk about some of the different areas that we need to have victory. So when we talk about victory over self, one of those areas is temptation. And from the very beginning, if you go back in the Garden of Eden, the very first thing that happened in the Garden of Eden was the enemy comes along and the first thing he wants Adam and Eve to do is question God's authority. We still live in a world like that. Question God's authority. Question anybody that God has put in authority. Question how things are being done. Question how things are going on in, the li in their lives or going on in the church. Then you find all through the temptation of Adam and Eve, right on through the Bible. There's been many times that the Bible talks about temptation. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter gives us a little bit of encouragement about what we need to do. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 
The Bible doesn't say that he is seeking you to have companionship and he's not seeking you to give you good advice. He's not seeking you to help you out. He's not seeking you to get you down the roadway of life. The Bible says he's seeking you whom he may devour. He wants to destroy you. We will look a little later on at Matthew chapter 4. I'm not going to read it right now, but where Jesus was tempted of the devil in the wilderness. And some things about that temptation we look at today, he uses the same tactics today, and he comes along with the same mentality today. And one thing that we need to understand this morning is Satan is real. You need to get that into your head. Satan is real. You can deny his existence, but it doesn't do away with the fact that he's real. You can deny his reality, and it doesn't do away with the fact that he's real. The same scripture that reveals the reality of God reveals the reality of Satan. And this morning we want to take for a few minutes and talk about knowing who that enemy is. Knowing the tactics he uses, because I'll tell you it will be beneficial when you go into the battlefield of life and he comes along and he throws something at you you never expected before. Failure to know your enemy can be catastrophic. He can come along and and if you're not watching for him, he can side swipe you and all of a sudden you're off your feet and you're wondering, man, how did this ever happen? Only to realize the enemy of your soul has come along and you fail to recognize him. And failing to know how to combat him when he does come along makes you very vulnerable makes you very vulnerable if you don't know how to combat him. You, you just simply, you know who he is and, and everything about him, but you don't have or have an understanding of his tactics or you don't understand how to fight him off. And God's provided us a whole arsenal of weapons and, and he's provided his word and he's provided us his armor and he's provided us all kinds of methods and means. But the thing is, if we don't pick them up and use them, then they're of no benefit to us. I'll give you an example of Something that it's just kind of like somebody doesn't use the armor of God or use the weapons God's give us. I would much sooner take a lighter, one of those long stick lighters to light my barbecue, or take a match even to strike and light my fire than to take two pieces of flint and try to make it. And that reminds me of a lot of people. A lot of people are are trying to fight the enemy and they're still using those old tactics that they think are going to work. Well, I'm striking my two pieces of flint together when God has given us a whole arsenal of real effective weapons. That very quickly we can push our enemy aside, but instead we play around with him and we uh, talk to him and we entertain him and then we wonder why we're in trouble. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? But God has to be for us. And, and I use that in two terms. If God be for us, I understand it means if God's with us. But let me put a little more sense on it. If God be for us, if God is, is with us in the sense he's walking in front of us, he's walking beside us, he's walking behind us, he's walking within us, who's going to defeat us? In 1 John 4 and 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that's in this world. It seems right now, if you look into the world, there seems to be a a large powerhouse of the enemy in the world. It just seems to be a steamroller going ahead. But the Bible still says the, the one that's within us is greater. The God that's within us is greater than this world. The reality of Satan and Job, Job understood how real Satan was. And you find in the very beginning of Job, The Bible says there was a day when the sons of God came and presented themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Job chapter 1, verse 6. So Satan showed up as well. When when we show up somewhere, I want to tell you something, Satan shows up as well. When you show up to talk to God, he's going to show up as well. He's not just standing in the bleachers and saying, I wonder what they're going to make for a decision. He loves to show up just like he did on the day in in the book of Job where he comes and the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, where are you coming from? You read it. 
What are you doing here? If I, if I put that in modern English, it says here, whence comest thou? What he was saying, what are you coming here for? What are you doing here? And Satan answered the Lord, and he said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And we just read the verse a minute ago where the Bible said he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What do you suppose his whole purpose of walking up and down in the earth and walking to and fro in it was? Right. To seek whom he could devour. In the first book of Genesis, or in Job rather, we find the first chapter. We find Satan showing up as one of the main characters. In the first book of Genesis, we find Satan showing up as one of the main characters. In those first few chapters of Genesis, he has a lot to do. He's insidious and he's relentless in his attacks. He doesn't stop just because we've, we think that he's going to stop or because, you know, we've got some agenda. He's not going to stop. His attacks are relentless. Since his expulsion from heaven, it appears he's been trying to get even with God. It's more or less, a, I'll show you, in the garden we see him behind God's back working. Man, I'll tell you, that's never changed. That's never changed. He still works behind God's back. He still works behind, he's always trying to do his manipulation. He gets as you as a saint, you'll find him in those wee hours using you and trying to use you. And you've got to find the right methods and means of battling him off. Otherwise, he will be effective in using you. In Job, he was complaining about the hedge that God placed around Job. Thank God for the hedge. We need to be praying, God, keep the hedge up. He attacked Israel and David. He resisted Joshua. He tempted Jesus in the wilderness. And today he still carries on those attacks against the church and against the saints. He hasn't stopped. In 2,000 years, don't think things have got better. We look at a world, we got automobiles, we don't drive horse and buggy. You know, there's days, I'll be honest, I wish I was back to the horse and buggy. Life would have been much simpler. In high school... We took bicycles and we built bicycles and put long forks on them. Anybody remember doing that? Anybody else here? In, oh, I see a few. You cut, the, you cut forks off another bike. You go to the junkyard and you put these long. You were so cool. You could hardly drive the thing. You'd be going down the long, longer the forks, the better it was. You'd be driving down the road and you could hardly sit on the thing, but you was cool. We took things apart, we broke things, we put things back together. We shot each other with BB guns. We got, my mother got calls by neighbors once in a while with, your kid shot my kid in the back with a BB gun and I had to dig it out. We did those things. Oh, I know that's not politically correct today. They'd throw you in jail for using a BB gun. The days was much simpler than we've got electronics today. You know, oh, it's terrible that you shot somebody with a BB gun, but some of the graphic stuff that our kids watch on those games that they play, far more damaging than a BB gun with a little mark in the flesh. When all you've done is you've marked their mind. Don't think our enemy's been asleep in all of this. He knows exactly the tactics that he's using. He's getting into the minds and the hearts of our young people. He's using technology. He's using media. I want to tell you, there's no such thing as going somewhere and seeing a pretty girl if you're a young boy and saying, wow, she's some pretty. I'd like to go on a date with her and, and having a three-dimensional view. You look them up on screen today and see them on some forum or something that's going on and, oh, there she is. And, and uh, you know, the same with the young ladies. What a terrible way to really meet somebody. You have no idea what you're running into. But yet, I want to tell you, our enemy is so busy at work with all of us, putting technology, getting us used to it, getting us used to all the things that he can use to destroy us. 
He still carries out his attacks against the church. It's never changed. His methods may change a little bit. His means may change a little bit. The way that he attacks you may change a little bit, but he's never changed in being relentless. What an insidious devil he is. Peter and John both wrote very sober warnings about his reality. They didn't just tell you, oh, watch out for the devil. He's just, you know, he's just a, a little, little. Peter said, be sober and be vigilant. He's an adversary. Those aren't, those aren't many little words. Those words mean something. He's a roaring lion. That's how he's going about. And you know what he's seeking to do? To devour you. And in Revelation it says, Therefore rejoice, ye hearers, and all that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And i got to get my glasses on. And of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath a short time. The Bible says the devil's come down to you having great wrath because he knows he's got just a little bit of time. There's many people that fail to believe in Satan for the same reason they don't believe in God. Because physically they can't see him. Because they can't touch him. They struggle to believe in him. But yet these same people accept the existence of electricity. They would argue with you that air exists. They would tell you there is such a thing as an atom, even though they've never seen it. And even viruses. They're so willing to accept these things. And you say, why? Because there's effects that happen because of electricity we have light there's effects that happen because of air we can go outside and it blows our hair around if you got hair atoms they've made bombs and they've done different things with it and even viruses you're all wearing masks or a lot of wearing masks hopefully pray that this mask thing gets behind us because we see the effects and they've, they've looked at the facts and says people are dying. So we've got we've to find some way to stop it. And many people fail to observe the effects of an almighty God. Even though they see the effects of the air, they see the effects of atoms, they see the effects of electricity, they fail to see the effects of God. And it's simply because they've closed their mind. They've closed their mind and they refused to accept the reality of God. Just because you reject the reality of God does not mean He does not exist. Just because you refuse to accept the reality of Satan does not make him any less real. But it does not nullify his, His existence, but it does nullify your resistance to Him. I don't believe in Him. You have no resistance to Him. For if we do not resist that which we do not believe, we have doubts that it exists, and therefore we don't even fight it when it's present. See, Satan does still attack people, and he comes along in our weakest points. He attacked Jesus at Jesus' point when he was hungry. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2 to 4, that Jesus had been in fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now you'd be pretty hungry after that. And afterward, the Bible said he was hungered, and the tempter came to him. And he said to him, if you'll be the son of God, picked up a stone, command that these stones be made bread. Jesus looked at him, and he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The very words that we find in Matthew chapter 4 and 1 tells us a little bit about it. It says, then was Jesus, and if you go on the last part, he tempted of the devil. It's just very thought-provoking. Satan would not have engaged in this activity if he had not thought he had a chance to be successful. As I was thinking about this the other night, I was thinking, doesn't he know who that he's tempting? And somewhere, and I was th- then I got thinking, but he must have thought that he could have persuaded him, otherwise he wouldn't have tempted him. 
even knowing that it's an utter failure, and I want you to put this in your mind and think about it, even though it may be a possibility of being an utter failure, and you say, I don't know why the enemy would ever come along and tempt me that. There's just no way he'll ever win at that battle with me. I want to tell you, he doesn't care. He still thinks in his mind that he can win in the battle regardless. It was obvious that Satan realized the flesh of Jesus would be enticed by his offer because he was hungry. So let's just tell him, why don't you make these stones bread? And uh, you say, well, that wouldn't have been such a bad thing. But it wasn't a matter of the physical appetite that was a problem. It was a matter of bowing down to the enemy's tactics. Because we all have physical appetites. It's very possible that we get also tempted by the things of the flesh and the things the flesh desires. Galatians said, chapter 5, verse 19, and when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, oops, that's not it. Let's get, if you got your Bibles, Galatians chapter 5, that's what copy and paste does. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. The Bible expresses very clearly what some sinful, fleshly, lustly things are. And it says they're manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I've told you, in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The word works here comes from a Greek word which translates actions or deeds. The actions or deeds of the flesh show up in these things. There's 17 acts that are talked about here, and attached to each one of these acts that's in the book of Galatians is a desire. You say, why would somebody commit adultery? Because there's a desire that precedes that. Why would somebody commit fornication? Because there's a desire that precedes that. Why would somebody have hatred? Because there's a desire that precedes that. Sin in its very embryonic stage is that, simply evil desire or want. And when this desire is conceived, James says, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. If we seek the Lord, He will deliver us from all ungodly desires. But we've got to realize He still has tactics and He'll keep coming at us. And if He doesn't get us one way, He'll come at us another way. And He attacks you at your weakest point of your life and in the weakest area of your life and at the weakest time of your life. Jesus had fasted 40 days and he was hungry. That's when he attacked him first. We need to discipline ourselves and put God first every day. Sometimes the temptation looks so innocent at the onset. Why is it wrong? You know, I'm hungry. There's some bread. Let's just make our stones. Let's make them bread. It, it looks so innocent. But undisciplined desire is a welcoming temptation for Satan and it's just like rolling the red carpet out to him say, hey, I know this is, looks innocent and it may appear innocent to turn these rocks to, to bread, but here, I'm rolling the red carpet out so you can come along with anything else that you want to throw at me. The first temptation of Jesus was equivalent to the first three lusts that the Bible talks about in the book of John. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, it's equivalent to that. I'm hungry. I'm hungry, the lust of the flesh. I want this. The flesh has things it wants. The lust of the flesh. I really like that, the lust of the flesh. Then temptation to become vain. After he couldn't tempt him with the flesh, he comes along and the Bible takes him up into a holy city. So here's something that is important with this. The first time you see Jesus, he's in the wilderness. The second time you see Jesus, he's in the middle of a city. First he's in desolation, now he's amongst people. He, if I could use this expression, he's downtown. The first time he's outside of the city of Toronto, the next time he's downtown Toronto. The first time he's in the backwoods of New Brunswick, the second time he's in the ma most massive city that you could imagine. Because here he is, and the Bible says he takes him up into the 
pinnacle of the temple. Now, if you know anything about Bible days, the temple would have been the central part of the city. They always built the church, and then they built all their, their buildings around it. So here he was. He took him up into the temple, and he said to him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down. Throw yourself out of this temple. For it's written, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands He shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Throw yourself out, and if God's really real, you'll be okay because he'll give angels charge to make sure you don't hit the ground. And you say, what's so bad about this second temptation is the fact that now he's in the middle of public eye. In the desert, it's one thing, but now Jesus is on the pinnacle of the temple, and if he threw himself out, there would be masses of people that would see him. And, and uh, this was the part of the pride or the ego. Look, just think, they don't really believe that you're God then. The appeal to the vanity of people will follow you then. If he couldn't destroy him privately, now the enemy is coming along thinking, well, I will try to destroy him publicly. If he couldn't defeat him in the country, let's take him to the city. We certainly need to be aware that his tactics doesn't stop just because he's in one place and we think that he won't be in another. The Bible says in Corinthians, lest Satan should get an advantage for us, of us. For we're not ignorant of his devices. He might get a little bit of an advantage. Watch out he doesn't get an advantage because you're not paying attention to what he's using. Watch out he doesn't get a, a leg up on you because you're not watching him. I remember a few number of years ago they was talking about a couple of guys were talking about racing and they had to put their feet in the blocks. And if you're familiar with blocks, they're, they put them in the ground and they'll rub, push two stakes down in them and, and the men will put their feet up or women will put their feet up against them and they'll run a 500 meter, 1,000 meter, whatever. And they had their feet up against the blocks and went to take off. And uh, relying on those that are on your team to set your blocks and run and normally you get down you check your blocks and apparently one of the blocks and one of the team members didn't get the blocks secured with a nice long bolt down into the ground and so the fastest runner lost out because he wasn't aware that those bolts that was expected or those long spikes wasn't in the ground and when he went and took off the blocks kicked out and just a few milliseconds behind taken off caused him to lose the race. Be aware of the enemy's tactics. They're not always visible. They're not always visible. He may pull those, those things that are holding you secure, those things that you rely on so much. He may pull them out from under you. You know, today you may have an opportunity, and, and I just share this with you. You may have an opportunity to say, I've got lots of opportunity to read my Bible, and I don't do it. What would you think if somewhere down the road you've lost your eyesight and now you can't read your Bible? Right. Tactic. The enemy will use whatever tactics he can. What better place for Jesus to show that he's invincible than to throw himself off of the temple? The plan was to have Jesus choose a path of his own success rather than the mission that God had planned for him. And he'll come along with you this very same way. God has a plan for your life. And the enemy will come along and say, but you know what? You could do this first. Why don't you try this method of fulfilling God's plan? God's got a plan for you to do something in your life and God has it well laid out and God knows exactly what you need. And instead of talking to God and saying, God, I want you to get me to where you want me to go and God, you provide an open door and all those other things, we push the door open and say, I'm going to make that plan myself. And you know what we do? We cause all kinds of messes. Because we've chose the plan. And this is exactly the tactics that Satan was trying to use against Jesus. Look, you could speed up people believing that you're God. You don't have to go to the cross. Throw yourself off of the pinnacle here and the angels will lift you up and people will believe that you're God. That was kind of, I, I believe, the concept that he was trying to portray here. 
And Jesus rejected it. He said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The second temptation goes along also with the second lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. In other words, you're, you know, you can, people will see you. The lust of the eyes, your pride will be lifted up. The crowd will tempt you to seek a crown instead of a cross all the time. The crowd will want you to, to find prestige in, in life rather than have to take the road of the cross. It's easier to laugh than it is to cry. It's easier to stand than it is to get on your knees and spend time in prayer. But those others are so necessary to take the way of the cross instead of the way of the crown. To find the road that is sometimes not the easy road. I made a statement to somebody the other day and, and they kind of... Uh, they looked at me kind of funny at first and then they kind of smiled and they didn't know what to say after that. They said, and we, they, we was talking about science. And they made the statement to them, me, they said, how could science be so wrong when there's so many that believe one way and there's only a few that believe the other? And I just looked at him and I said, well, I said, I got a Bible that said, wide is the road. And many there be that follow the road to destruction. I said, masses doesn't make right. right sure, sure. I wasn't trying to say anything negative about anything. I was just saying that and that's a reality. Just because thousands believe one way doesn't make them right. Just because the majority of the world has decided to go to hell doesn't mean that's the best place to go. Just because the wide road looks so easy doesn't mean it's the right road. Find that little back road sometimes and it, it's the right road. See, the thing is, is to understand that sometimes it's walking alone with the Lord rather than following the masses with your friends. And the last part was when the devil took Jesus into an exceeding high mountain. He's tried the country. He's tried the city. Now he's out into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he showed them the glory of these kingdoms, the money, the riches, the wealth, the, the power, the prestige of all the glory of these kingdoms and how wonderful these kingdoms was. Now he's gone from trying to entertain that to saying, now if you would simply, all these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. When private temptation had failed and public temptation had failed, now he takes Jesus to a high mountain and promised him something that was already his. He showed him the glory of the kingdoms of the world and even one day Jesus, these would belong to him. Satan still tempted him to speed up God's plan. I'll tell you, you can do something better here than just let's speed God's plan up. I know they might be yours, but someday you'll have them, but I can give them to you now. Don't take the difficult route to the cross. This is the easy road. Why would you want to go to the cross, Jesus? Here's a simple road. Just yield to me. All this can be yours. How many times has the enemy used those very same tactics on you? Don't take that difficult road of being a Christian. You know, people will laugh at you for being a Christian. You know, it's a hard road because there is some expectation from God for you to live a certain life. And, and you know, why would you want to do those things? Take the easy road that everybody else has taken. All your friends will help you out. Just yield to me and this all can be yours. But I'm going to tell you something. He doesn't tell you about what happens with some of those things that the enemy promises. He doesn't tell you about the sorrow at the end of that road. He doesn't tell you about the pain and suffering that happens down the road. He doesn't tell you about what is at the end of the journey. He doesn't tell you about how terrible it is if you go to hell. 
He just paints a wonderful picture of life on earth if you live for Him. Victory over temptation in Matthew, Jesus said, and him get thee hand Satan. For it is written, and this is, I'm going to come to a close this morning, it's written. Remember, I said you're, some of you are over 50, 60, so I get 50 or 60 minutes. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Wow. And then the devil leaveth him, and the angels came and ministered unto him. James says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's so much power in prayer and praise. We cannot fight the devil alone. Don't think for one instance you have the ability and power within self to fight off his his wiles and to fight off his devices. You do not. This is why we must pray. This is why we must learn to pray. This is why prayer is so essential. This is why the devil has tacked so much in our generation of removing time for young people so that they don't seem to have time to pray. He wants them to look at entertainment. Look, you can spend 50 minutes being entertained doing this and and you don't have to pray. We still need to know how to pray. Prayer is an admission of our need as well as our faith. When I pray, it's an admission that, God, I need you. It's not just a show of my faith. When I pray every day, it's because I need him. It's not because I'm just saying, oh, well, you know, this is my faith, so I'm going to pray. We pray because we have need. We pray because we can't do it alone. We pray because we need his strength. We pray because we need his power. We pray because we need his anointing. We can't do it alone. And praise always has its motivation in exalting God. We sing sometimes when we come to church. We'll sing out different songs or whatever. And the reason we do, we exalt Him. For this reason, praise is very effective in fighting off the enemy because it exalts God. It puts God in His rightful place. It shifts the emphasis from me to Him. It shifts the emphasis from ourselves to God. When we put too much emphasis on self, all of a sudden we begin to think about self and we begin to work towards self and we begin to give things to self and the enemy has got us right where he wants us, thinking about self and then he can deal with us. How about you do this and temptation comes along? If you really want to overcome temptation, you'll never do it without prayer. Listen to me, church. If you want to overcome temptation, you'll never be effective at overcoming temptation unless you have a prayer life. And that doesn't mean a prayer life when you get in trouble. That means a consistent walk with God. The greatest need for prayer and praise usually occurs when we feel like doing it the least. Our greatest need is when we don't feel like doing it at all. You know, I'd get down to pray before when I've been tired. And I've been praying along and then a few minutes later thinking, what did I just say? I'm not alone. Some of you have done that. You might not admit it. It's been there too. You're praying along and in a few minutes you're, you're just kind of, you, you find yourself maybe mumbling or going to sleep or whatever and, and then you look back and say, what did I say? I want to tell you something. You say, is that effective? Absolutely. You say, why is it effective? Because your heart is where it needs to be. You're in the position where you need to be. God still knows what's the very intent of your heart. He knows what's up here before when you don't even know what's going on up there. Victory over temptation is contained in five verbs, and I'm going to close with this this morning. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Submit yourselves, verb number one. 
Resist, verb number two, the devil. Draw, verb number three, nigh to God. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Satan gets further away from us as we get closer to God. And I know that's not a secret that I'm telling you this morning. But if we've got divided service, we're in trouble. The Bible said we'll either serve one master or we'll serve the other. It said man cannot serve two masters in Matthew chapter 6, 24. For either he will serve the one and hate the other or he'll hold the one and despise the other. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. Three times in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was tempted by the devil. Three times he resisted with this, it is written. There's nothing any more powerful, nothing any more powerful to a saint than using the word of God. There's nothing any more powerful to the saint than take the sword of the spirit, which the Bible said, which is the word of God. There's nothing any more powerful than that. And there's nothing any more powerful than a saint that knows how to pray and take this book and use it in effect when they need to. If you want to overcome temptation, you can't do it in yourself, number one. You have to rely on God, number two. But you still got to do your part and read the Bible and pray. The Bible says take on the whole armor of God. I'm not going to get into that this morning, but... There's a lot to it. If I want to be effective in my life, I'm not going to have victory by wishful thinking. Right. He will throw me down every time. I really get a kick out of watching these guys. I, I watched the other day, and they, they got some of these the stupidest sports out now. There's a sport now called a slapping sport. You go on YouTube, you haven't got it. It's quite amazing to watch people be that stupid. They'll stand across the table from each other and look at each other like that, and the guy will go, whap, and he'll smack the guy in the head, and if the guy don't get knocked out, the other guy gets a turn. Kind of like playing knuckles years ago, but that just hurt your knuckle. I'm not going to stand on the other side of the table and let somebody smack me. And then I thought, there can't, they can't get any more stupid than this. And the other day, I seen one where the guys, and if you've ever seen an arm wrestling table, they got a little peg on each side, and the guys put their arms up. Well, now what they do is they got a peg and they, they tape their arms to the peg or, or maybe they don't tape, they tape them together and let them smack each other. But they have to hold the peg. If they let go of the peg, they lose. And they wrap their, their hand up with an MMA glove, mixed martial arts glove, and they hit each other. And the guy that lets go of the peg is the loser. And I'm thinking, we live in a world that is so stupid. What they'll do for entertainment. And yet when you come to church and worship God and love God and get excited about the things of God, they call us crazy. I'll tell you what, there's nothing any more exciting than living for God and being victorious and walking with Him. Let's stand this morning. God bless you today. Thank you for coming to the house of God. I appreciate so much every saint of God that comes. It means a lot. Because it shows that you're hungry for the things of God. When you get out to church and house of God anytime, it shows that you're hungry for the things of God. We need to be hungry for the things of God. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we're just thankful today for the privilege to gather in your house. Lord, thankful for each saint of God that's here this morning. And Lord, I pray God that for each one of us today that you would help us, Lord, to overcome temptation, to use all of the tools that you've given us in our tool belt. Lord, the Bible that we've been given, that we'll read it. Lord, the prayer life that you allow us to have, that we'll use prayer as that weapon that we need to use. Bless each one of us today. Lord, keep your hand upon us throughout the day we pray and the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God